1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you would please stand for the reign of God's word if you're able to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Again, verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, approve all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our text this evening will be verse 21 and 22. It says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. I'd like to preach to you discernment, the key to locking the security gate. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have blessed us with. And Lord, there's some things that need to be locked and protected against. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have the discernment and the understanding of those things, Lord, which would attack our lives, those things which would draw us away from you. Lord, in a day and time when it seems everybody is accepting everything, Lord, I pray that Christians would have spiritual discernment. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us to enjoy the time together and the fellowship afterwards. For us pray in Jesus' name, amen. You be seated. God's people need to have some discernment about things. There's a gate that needs to be locked with discernment. Not allowing certain things into our lives. Not allowing things to be accepted in our lives. Many times there's a lot going on that that people are just accepting because they think that everybody else is accepting it, so they accept it. The church down the road may accept it, so they accept it. We're living in a day and time when Satan is pretty sharp and he's pretty, pretty cagey in how he gets us to accept a lot of things. We're to have discernment about things, about Scripture, about the Christian life, about people, about good and evil and right and wrong. Many times we're finding today that people are accepting a lot of things that are wrong and calling it right. It seems as though we've become so gullible in this day and time and by accepting all kinds of junk. We find over in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, and I see this so prevalent. I'm seeing it more and more in the day and time which we're living in. Well, I've been, I've been noticing it, maybe it's just because the Lord's drawn my attention to some things lately, and, and it's really been uh, on my heart. And, but in Isaiah 5 and verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Otherwise, changing things around. It's no longer that there's a right and wrong, if they're switching it around, and, 
And the world would look at many Christians today and say that we're the problem because we're so hard-nosed about some things, that we're not tolerant about some things. But I want you to understand something. It's not about tolerance. It's about the Word of God. It's about what God says. It's about what God wants. It's not about what I want. It's not what I want to be tolerant about it. And to be honest with you, the flesh would rather not fight the battles. The flesh would rather just go on and accept everything and, and everything's rosy and everything's fine. But that's not what God wants. We need some spiritual discernment. You see, Satan is disguised as an angel of light, the Scripture talks about. He wants to confuse the people of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, is no, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And basically what he's talking about is the deception that even preachers are putting forth today. And different ones are deceiving people into believing this is okay and that's all right. And there's no longer the discernment that there used to be. We need to get back to the Word of God. We need to get back to the Scripture and see what the Bible says about it. It doesn't matter if it's popular. What does the Bible say about it? It doesn't matter if the church down the road is accepting it. What does the Bible say about it? It doesn't matter if, if Uncle John or, or, or Aunt Susie or, or even Grandma or whoever it is, that's what they say. What does the Bible say about it? We need discernment today. We need understanding. We can't go by traditions. We must go by the Word of God. We find the Scripture warns us of different things, and I'm just going to run over a few real here, real quick. I'm not going to read the Scripture because of time. You can write these down if you want to. Deceitful spirits. It talks about the Scripture warns against deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 1. We're living day and time when there's a lot of deceitful spirits out there that's deceiving and it's, it's because of the work of Satan. The myths and things that people will try to teach and in, 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 when it's not in reality, it's not in truth. 1 Timothy 1.4 uh, speaks against it. And, and Titus 1.14, perverse things. We're living day and time when there's all kinds of perversion and perverse things happening in our society, in our day and time. And, and the thing is, is to be tolerant about it and to accept it. I mean, just roll over and, and just, all oh, forget about it. I'll live my life, you live your life. Hey, I want you to understand something. My life affects other people's lives, and their life affects my life. And so I want to live what's right. And so we find there the perverse things. It warns against the perverse things in Acts 20 and verse 30. There's warnings of, in the Scripture, the commandments of teachings of, men, and men, uh, teachings of men instead of the teachings of the Word of God. You'll find a lot of men that they'll take and they'll twist the Scripture. You'll find that men will come up with all kinds of teachings and, and different things in this day and time. But in Colossians 2 and verse 22, it warns against that. Titus 1.14 warns against it. The foolish and ignorant speculation, 2 Timothy 2.23, warns against it. False knowledge and empty chattering, uh, chattering going on. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.20 it, it warns against it. The traditions of man, uh, the Scripture warns against it in Colossians 2.8. And so on goes the Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, warning against these type of things that's going on in our day and time. If we was to look again there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, notice what the Lord's doing here. He's going down through here, and He's warning us of the last days. And He's saying, there's no reason for you to be in darkness. If you're saved, you should have some understanding. You shouldn't be deceived. He goes on and he talks about there and he says in verse 5, he says, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 5, Ye are the children of light, and the children of the day are not of the night nor of the darkness. We're not of this world. Understand something. Hey, listen, if you get nothing else tonight, get this. If you're saved, you're not part of this world. And you're not supposed to live like it. You're not supposed to live like it. And a lot of times we... That bothered us because we want to be accepted by the world. My friend, realize you're not part of the world. We've got, a different, we've got a different citizenship. Our citizenship, if you're saved, is in heaven. And we each need to live as though uh, we understand that citizenship. Verse 6 says, therefore let us not sleep. He said, don't, don't fall asleep at the, at the controls here. Man, stand, stand firm in these last days. He said, but watch. Or, but let us watch and be sober. He said, hey, listen, get some good thinking about you. And today I find Christians that are not thinking right. 
They're not keeping a good head on their shoulders. They're not thinking spiritual. And he goes on and says, but in verse 8, he says, but let us who are the day be sober again. He talks about that. Then he comes down and you find over here in verse 11, he says, edify one another. He said in these last days, he said, encourage one another, build one another up in the faith. Don't be tearing us down by not, by not following the word of God. You see, here's the thing. Jacob's life affects me. My life affects Jacob. Our lives affect these boys on the front row. Their lives affect your kids. Your life affects your kids. Your life affects the kids of others. Your life affects other, uh, your, your marriage and your life there affects other people's married life. And on goes the, the testimony, and on goes the influence that we have in our life. And so we're to edify, we're to build up one another. He goes on down and he talks about not quenching the Spirit and living for the Lord and pr uh, prayer, pray without ceasing. And, and on down it goes down through there and despise not the prophesyings and so forth. And so we see these different things that, that he's talking about in the last days. All these are all the things that we're seeing here that I mentioned a while ago. The scripture warns against are pitfalls for a Christian. And too many times today I'm finding Christians don't know their Bible well enough and they're falling for the, for the wiles of the devil as he's trying to deceive them. Jesus warned of the wolves in sheep's clothing in Matthew 7, 15. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Today I'm seeing people that are ravaged by, by those who say that they're pastors and preachers and, and the false teachings that's going out across the TV and, and even across the radio and different things like that in a lot of instances, even in churches, even in this area. And all the junkets, and listen, the Methodist church right now, they're in a big battle over, over homosexuality, whether to accept it and to have homosexual preachers and so forth going on. Hey, it's a big battle. You say, well, preacher, you know, you've got to be taught, and they need a preacher too. Yeah, they need a preacher that's going to stand on the Word of God. That's going to get up and call sin, sin. And, and, and homosexuality is an abomination, the Bible says. It is sin. But yet we're trying to be all inclusive and accept everything into the church and accept everything in and, and, and act as though there's nothing wrong with it. We need some discernment. We need some understanding in our day and time of what the Bible says. Get back to the Scripture. So Satan is busy trying to deceive, cause Christians to fall away uh, as much as possible. So we as Christians need discernment, the ability to judge good and evil and right and wrong. In 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. He said, don't believe everything that you see and hear. And there's one thing that I've always told people over the years as I preach. Get your Bible and make sure that I'm preaching the right thing. Know what the Bible says. Because I'm fallible, I'm a human. And if I was to get out of the will of God, I could get off on, a, on the wrong direction and lead people the wrong direction. Stay in your Bible. Know the Word of God. Have a discerning spirit. He says, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. He said, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. And so much today, we don't try the spirits. We just accept it. We don't want the battle. We don't want somebody thinking that we're hard-nosed. And so we, we, we just kind of brush it off and we accept so much. Paul gives us three guidelines for discerning Christians, for Christians to discern. We find that in verse 21 and 22. And look at it here again. It says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. There's three things there that I want to talk about just for a few minutes that we need to have to be able to discern right and wrong. First of all, judge everything. I say, oh, preacher, you shouldn't have said that. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. But the Lord tells us to judge with a righteous judgment. It's not talking about a critical spirit of a person, but it's talking about judging right and wrong. He said, well, I, I, I just see this. You, you shouldn't judge anything. Then, you're, then you don't understand the Scripture. Then you are misled already. Because every day, every person in this room makes some type of judgment. You make some type of discernment. That is what judgment is, a discernment. 
If I was to have you walking out here and, and walking down a path uh, uh, by the river and all of a sudden you see a snake laying there, uh, are you going to walk up and say, you know, that might be a garter snake or that might be a, 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 you know, a king snake? No, you're going to make a judgment. Is that a rattlesnake? Is that a copperhead? Is that a cotton mouth? What is that snake? And if you don't know, are you going to pick it up? You're crazy if you do. And we make a judgment. My judgment is, every snake ought to be dead. That's my judgment. Unless I know it's a king snake. I usually don't bother a black snake or a king snake. If it's a king snake, leave them alive, let them kill the, the bad snakes. But if I don't know if it's a king snake, he better run. The thing of it is, we make a discernment about right and wrong. Every one of us, we've got to realize that there is some judgments that we have to make in our lives and judge right and wrong looking to make sure that, that the things that we have, no sir, it says, prove all things. The very first one, he says, prove all things. Make sure that it's right. You know, too much is accepted without proving it. We are to judge between truth and error, right and wrong, good and evil. Jesus said in John 7, 24, now the, here you go. It says, he says, judge not according to the appearance of, so you say, oh, there, so you go, preacher, you're not supposed to judge. He says, judge not according to the parents, but judge righteous judgment. He says, prove it. Make sure that it's right. Make sure that it lines up with the Word of God, judging by that which is righteous and right. The Word of God, the final authority. He said, well, preacher, I mean, you're, you're just so tied up with the Word of God that you think everything uh, should be ruled around the Word of God. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. We take too much for face value and, and, and how it stacks up to, the, to, the, uh, to this world instead of how it stacks up to the Word of God. We need to begin to discern with righteous judgment, with discernment from the Word of God. How does this... Line up with the Word of God. You know, I mentioned this morning, we talked about, you know, and I'm not going to, you say, your hobby horse. No, I, it, it just saw my, my mind because I see we're in trouble in this nation. We, we've come to this point where we say, well, we've got to vote for the lesser of two evils. That's man's judgment. The Scripture says, righteousness exalteth the nation. And so we got to go for righteousness. You say, well, preacher, there's not anything righteous running. No, but there's a blank there that you can write a name in. Because I'm going to stand before God and give an account. And I don't think he's going to say, well, at least you voted for the lesser of two evils. No, he's going to say you voted for evil. And so we got to get back to what the Bible says. And we've accepted so much that's not in the Scripture anymore. And we've been fooled and we've been, we've been misled by uh, uh, all this stuff in this day and time. We find here that it says, he, uh, you know, we, we need to seek what the Lord wants us. We need to judge everything according to the Word of God. We take too much for face value. What does the Holy Spirit impress in your heart? When's the last time before you made a judgment that you just begin to pray about and say, Holy Spirit, would you show me? Would you show me what truth is? Would you show me what's right? Because in 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. And we're to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. And, and, and to, to show us. He says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so He's to show us and to guide us. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in to dwell within you. Lexi, when you got saved today, God moved in. God moved in. Within you lives the Holy Spirit of God. The person of God. And now He wants to direct your life. He wants to direct all of our lives. You say, well, preacher, how do you talk to Him? You talk to Him like you would anybody else. Holy Spirit, would you guide me today? Would you show me? Is this right? Is it wrong? Would you give me an understanding? Show me in the Scripture. Show me. Give me peace or, or take the peace away about it. How does it affect our testimony also? How does it tes uh, affect our testimony how does it affect the testimony of Christ? How does it affect the testimony of the church? Ask some questions. Have a discerning spirit. Judge everything. Prove all things is what the Scripture says. 
Number two, hold on to that which is good. In verse, in verse of 21 there it says, Hold fast that which is good. We're to hang on to that which is good. Romans chapter 12 verse 9, the latter part says, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. You know what, sometimes we think, well, I've got more good than I've got bad. So everything's all right. It, the good outweighs the bad. No, my friend, he said, cleave to that which is good. Abhor that which is evil. Get rid of that which is evil and just hang on to that which is good. If I was to, if I was to take a, a, a 10 pounds of potatoes here and I put 2 pounds of rotten potatoes in with your 10 pounds of potatoes, you got more good potatoes than you have rotten potatoes for a while. For a while. That's why he says, abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Hang on to that which is good. You know, there's a lot of good things in our homes and our lives that we really need to hang on to. And the scripture teaches we need to hang on and cleave to those things. Godliness, righteousness, holiness. I mean, love, the love of God in our homes and in our lives and in our church. The unity of, of God and working in hearts and lives. We need to cleave to those things. We don't need to be changing those things. We don't need to be getting rid, rid of them. But we need to begin to look at those things which shouldn't be there and get rid of those things that shouldn't be in our lives and, and clean up our lives and get rid of those things. You see, the Bible tells, tells us to cleave to that which is good. What's good? The Word of God. It don't get any better than the Word of God. Cleave to it, man. Put it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hey, listen, the Word of God is so important. We need to cleave to it and put it in our hearts and lives. The principles are laid down by... We need to cleave to those principles that's laid down by the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 13 and 14, it says, Hold fast the form of sound, uh, sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The Word of God should be precious in our lives. It should guide us and direct us. Cleave to it. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful of that promise. What do you hang on to? Hang on to your salvation. And, and don't get me wrong what I'm saying. I'm not talking about you can lose your salvation, you can't lose your salvation. But what I am talking about is hold it precious to your heart and life. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed of the day that you got saved. Man, I tell you what, there's one thing that I like to share with people, and that's telling about the time I got saved. I got saved in, on a Wednesday night, middle of May of 1975. I'm not ashamed of Christ. He wasn't ashamed of me. And I told Lexi and I told Corey today when they got saved, I said, listen, the Lord loves you. And he went to Calvary and died in your place. He wasn't, he wasn't ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of him. Amen. Live for him. Boy, hold dear to that salvation which he's given you. It's precious. It's something that, that is precious in this day and time. Hold to that which is good. Cleave to that which is good. Hang on to it. Let it be a part of your life, everyday life, not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but every day. Meeting with the Lord, talking with the Lord, spending time with God. Allow Him to work in our hearts and lives. Then thirdly, turn from evil and wrong. Look in verse 22. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. You say, preach that's kind of a different way. Why don't you say just abstain from evil, all evil? Because there's some things that plain old look evil that mislead people that we accept in this day and time. I use the example, and it's getting harder all the time. Years ago, and it was a little bit different. When I lived in Piedmont down in southeast Missouri, and we had what they called Clearwater Lake. I was a youth pastor down there, youth, pa youth pastor for 17 years down there. Well-known, small town, had a business for several years and well-known in town. Had a good-sized youth group and, and good, strong church was there. There was a, a lure that was just absolutely tearing up the white bass out at Clearwater Lake. I mean... Everybody that had that lure was catching white bass like crazy. You could throw everything else at them, and you'd catch one now and then, but you throw that at them, and they was flat eating it up. I liked fish. And I was asking somebody, I said, man, where you get that? And they said, you get it down at Zeke's? I said, can you get it at Walmart? Can you? And there, there wasn't a bass pro around there. 
fact, that was back before you heard much about Bass Pro. He said, no, the only place we've ever found that you get is down at Zeke's. Well, Zeke's is a packaged liquor store. They, sell, they sold shotgun shells and hunting stuff and, and fish and tackle, but their biggest thing was liquor. Say, preacher, did you go in and get one? Nope, I didn't. I fished for crappie instead. How come? Because I didn't want somebody, because it was on, on, the main, on the main drag there, lots of traffic, uh, there's, a, there's kind of a Y there, and the people going back and forth. There was a, a Walmart here, and a, 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 a kind of like a Dairy Queen here, and just, and just a lot of traffic right there. And you pull in there, there's you're in the front and everything. And I didn't want to see somebody see me coming out carrying a brown paper bag. Why? Because the appearance of evil. They didn't know what was in that bag. And I wasn't going to go in there and buy the lure and come out like this here. <laughs> and, I, and I understand it. It's, it's, we're living in a day and time. It's, I mean, Walmart and every, every, every other place now carries the liquor and stuff. But in that day, it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. You, you couldn't even buy liquor in the, in the gas stations in that day. It's a lot different. I understand. But I'm giving you an example. It was the appearance of evil that I was trying to stay away from. I didn't want somebody to say, yeah, yeah, I, I seen old Rodney Haggett down there. I seen him come out of Zeke's. Oh, really? What do you think he was buying? I don't know, but he's carrying a brown bag. And they want, listen to me, they want to think the worst. They want to. Because they want to bring you down from your testimony of Christ down here because it takes the conviction out of your testimony. And so, you say, preacher, have you ever been in Zeke's? Never. Never. I don't even know if it's still there, but I've never, never been in it because of the testimony's sake. The appearance of evil. There's things in our lives that honestly... You say, well, preacher, would it be... Would, would have it been a sin for you to go in there and buy that lure? No, it would not have been. It would not have been a sin. I was buying a fishing lure. But the appearance of it could have misled somebody. Maybe a teenager, somebody that I'd won to Christ, maybe somebody I was witnessing to. And they see me coming out there carrying a package. And I could have lost the opportunity to win somebody to Christ or lost the opportunity to help somebody grow in Christ. The appearance of it. There was nothing wrong. And there's things today that there's absolutely nothing wrong with necessarily for you to do of it, but the appearance of it may be the appearance of evil. Okay? Abstain from the appearance of evil. Not just the evil itself, but even the appearance of evil. The appearance of it. So many times today that we, we've taken our liberties, and, and, and the Lord deals with it, and I don't have time to deal with it, about our liberties. We have liberties to do things. But if our liberty causes the weak to fall, or the weak to, to, to fall into sin, then we have abused that liberty. Turn from evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Uh, Romans 16, verse 19, the latter part says, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Can I tell you something? Listen, parents, listen to this, especially if you're a parent, listen to me. Your kids don't need to know about everything that's evil. They don't need to know the, the latest thing going on. They need to be simple concerning that. There's no use putting that junk in their mind and causing them to think upon it. It says, be simple concerning that which is evil. And that's the same way with us. We don't need to go investigating absolutely everything that's evil out there, what's the latest thing. My mom used to work in a bank in Piedmont. And we was talking one day, and she went, of course, when she started, she went through quite a bit of training and stuff. And we was talking one day, she was talking about the training uh, for identifying counterfeit money. I said, oh, what all stuff they show you? She said, absolutely nothing. She said, they put 
real money in front of you and they make you study it. I said, didn't they show you all the little things that they do to look for? She said, no. They said, if you'll study the real stuff, you'll spot the counterfeit. You, all of a sudden, you'll see there's something not right about that bill. And you'll spot it. She said, you handle so much money during the day and going through and everything. She said, if, you, if you're always looking for it, you're going to miss it. She said, but there's something about it. And they, and, and they found some down there. And they brought it by them. They showed them. And, and they could immediately pick it out because they had looked at the, the, at the real money. And then when a counterfeit come across, it's like there's something not right. It just stood out. They didn't know exactly what it was, but there's something not right. And then, then they would look at it and they would find it. Can I tell you something? Be simple, concerned that with G is evil. If you will put all the right things in, if you will study the Word of God, if you will listen to the right music, if you will watch only the right programs, if you will only uh, do that which is righteous and holy and godly, you'll have a discerning spirit about that which is evil and that which is wrong. You may not be exactly able to figure it out at the moment, but there'll be a red flag come up. Over the years when the kids were younger and everything, there'd be times that, that they'd want to do this or that, or, and of itself there was nothing wrong with it, or go to somebody, somebody's house or something, and there, was, and there would just be something come up, a red flag in my mind. And, and, I, and literally, I, I remember at times they would say, well, why not? And I couldn't give them an answer why not. There was something that my spirit wasn't settled with. And I would just say, well, I just don't feel good about it. And I wasn't just given an excuse because I just didn't feel good about it. My friend, we need to have a discerning spirit. If we don't feel good about it, then don't. Then don't. Many times we try to give in because we don't want to be different. Have that discerning spirit. Fill your heart and mind with truth and righteousness. You can discern good and evil and right and wrong then. In closing, Titus 1 verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And Philippians 1 9 says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all Judgment. We need to turn from evil and wrong. We need to cleave to that which is good. Discerning right and wrong by the Word of God, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and cleave to that which is good in these last days. There's going to be so many things going to bombard Christians, and, and a lot of other Christians are going to go the direction of the world. I'm warning you. We're already seeing it. That's why you've got to be sharp. You've got to be awake. You've got to be sober, the Bible says. And don't fall for those traps that Satan is setting. Take the Word of God and discern through the Scripture and through the Spirit of God. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And maybe not you just want to come and say, Lord, help me to be a discerning parent. Help me to be a discerning Christian. Help me to be a witness for you. Help me to make sure that the right things are in my life. And just ask the Lord to give you discernment. And guidance. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for the mercies of God. I pray now, Lord, that you be with us um, during this invitation. Lord, have your will and wait for us. Pray in Jesus' name.